In this video, we're going to look at the operations we can do on regular languages. In particular, we're going to look at the so-called regular operations. Uh, these are union, concatenation, and star. We'll begin with giving a definition of what these operations are. So we're going to look at union, concatenation, and star. These are operations that we can do on languages. So if you've got two languages, like A and B, we can do an operation on them and come up with another language. And these are called the regular operations. And we'll see that uh, they're oftentimes used on regular languages, but in general they're defined on any language. So let's define what union, concatenation, and star are. In other words, let's define what these operations do. So let's assume you have two languages, A and B. Okay, so A is a set of strings and B is a set of strings. What is the union operation on these languages? Well, it's just a union operation on sets. There's, there's no difference. So the union of two sets means that uh, is just the set of all things that are either in one set or the other. So you just combine the two sets. So if these two sets are languages, then you're looking at a larger language that contains every string that's either in either A or B or perhaps both. Concatenation is something that makes more sense only for strings and so languages, uh, it's an operation on languages. And we generally use the small circle here as the symbol for concatenation but sometimes we just put two things together like we did right here to indicate concatenation. So when you've got two languages and you want to concatenate them, um, if it's not clear what's going on, I prefer to put a little zero there to show you that we're talking about the operation of concatenation on languages. And so this is a, a set operation, if you will, that works on sets of strings. And the concatenation of two languages is just the set of all strings that can be divided into two parts. The first part is something that's in the language A, and the second part is something that's in the language B. In other words, any string you can get by taking something from language A and gluing it onto the front of something from language B. Every string in this language has two parts. The first part comes from A and the second part comes from B. And if you've got a bunch of strings in A and a bunch of strings in B's, you can make a string from the concatenation language by taking something from A and concatenating it with something from B. And the final example is the star operation. And the star operation basically you're given a language A and, and you can star that language to get a larger language. And it consists of all the strings that you can take by pieces of, of uh, by strings, if you take a bunch of strings from A and you glue them together, okay, zero or more strings from A and you glue them together, then you get a string that's in A star. And notice that I said zero or more, okay, so you could have the empty string. The empty string is always in the star. So it, any sequence of pieces where each piece comes from A. They don't necessarily need to be the same, but each substring in the element of A star is itself an element of A. So let's look at some examples down here of these things. We'll start with union. So in our example, Let's assume that we have an alphabet of just the alphabetic characters. And our set A, the language A, consists of only two strings. And B consists of only two strings. That means that our examples are relatively small, but uh, they're easier to show that way. Now if you union two sets, you just create the set containing all the elements from both the sets. So you have A, A, you have X, you have B, and you have YY. What about the concatenation 
of languages A and B? Well, it consists of four strings, and each one of those strings has something that comes from A, language A, so AA, little AA, or, or little B, or it has something uh, followed by something that comes from language B, which is X or YY. So we can make different strings this way. So uh, here I've chosen little AA from language A and X from language B. Here I've chosen little B from language A and again X from language B. So these are all the things we can make from concatenation. Every string in the concatenation has two parts. The first part comes from the first language and the second part comes from the second language. Now let's look at star, a star. We can ignore the language B in this example. So the language A contains two strings and so we make an infinite number of strings. Every star language is infinite except I suppose if it contains only, if A contained only the empty string or was itself empty. Um, but in any non-trivial example A star will be infinite. And of course we have epsilon and we have everything that's in A, 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 and B. And then we start making new strings by choosing strings that are in A. So we can have A, 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 or A, A, B, or B, A, A, or B, B. And that has, each of these four has just two parts. And then we have the strings that are made of three things. All of those three things are from the language A. And then we have the strings that are made of four things, and so on and so forth. Next we want to look at some closure properties. In particular we want to ask is the class of regular languages closed under union? And what that means is if you've got two regular languages and you use the union operator on them, is the result itself also a regular language? So this is uh, similar to saying um, integers are closed under addition. If you take two integers and you add them together, the thing you get is also an integer. Division, uh, in integers are not closed under division. For example, if you take two integers and you divide one by the other, the result is not necessarily an integer. So we're asking, is the class of regular languages closed under union? In other words, if two languages are regular, then it turns out, and this is the theorem, their union is, is also a regular language. So the answer is yes, they are closed. And we can look at the proof. Um, so our proof is by construction. Okay, Because these languages are regular, we know that there must be a finite state machine to recognize them. So what we're going to do is build a new finite state machine to recognize the union. And if we can build a new finite state machine that recognizes the union of L1 and L2, then that proves that the union is a regular language and therefore that it's closed. And so here's our approach. We're going to take, uh, well, let's, let, here's our first approach, I should say. Uh, let's imagine that we have a machine that recognizes M1 and a machine that recognizes M2. Okay, I've just drawn it sort of an outline here. And then somehow we're going to combine these machines, uh, maybe uh, combine the states. Uh, and well, I, oops, wait a minute, what have I done here? I've combined the, uh, these two states. Here we had uh, two edges for A and two edges for B. And in, in this new machine, I've got two edges for A and two edges for B. And well, that's not a valid F, uh, finite state machine. So we've got to do a little bit better than that. So that's our, our proof is by construction. And we do build a new machine, but we have to be a little bit careful about how we do it so we don't end up with an invalid machine, something that's not a finite state machine, like this quick approach. Well, my first attempt at building a combined machine that was going to, represent, that was going to recognize L1 union L2 didn't work. So the next approach might uh, be to try running the first machine, and if that doesn't work, it, then it determines that the string is not in L1. Then we try running machine M2 and seeing if the string is in language L2. 
But unfortunately, that is not going to work because remember, with finite state machines, we cannot back up in the input. Once we've looked at the input, we don't get a second chance. Okay, we can't rewind, if you will. So our idea instead is going to look like this. What we're going to do is, in a sense, simulate M1 and M2 simultaneously. So we're going to imagine going through the finite state machine M1 as we scan the string and simultaneously in parallel going through the machine M2 as we scan the input. So at any one moment in time as we scan through the input, we're in some state in machine M1 and we're in some other state in M machine M2. So we're going to construct a new machine, M, in which every state corresponds to two states, one from M1 and one from M2. So let's go through this here carefully. Uh, first of all, um, we're going to assume we've got two machines for languages L1 and L2. So each one has a set of states that's, that's different. And we're going to just assume that our alphabets are the same. If there were some differences, you could define a combined alphabet. We've got two transition functions. Each of these machines has its own starting state and set of final states. And what we need to do is we need to come up with a new set of states, Q, and a new transition function, delta, somehow combining delta 1 and delta 2. A new starting state, Q0, that's different from the starting states in machine 1 or 2 and a new set of final states. And so like I said, we're going to assume the alphabets are the same. Um, and if they weren't, we could construct a union of those. And each state in the new machine that we construct will represent two states, one from M1 and one from M2. So there are obviously lots of possible combinations. So let's try and look at how this is going to work. So let's imagine that we've got our two machines M1 and M2. And to keep things clear, I, I label the states in M1 with XYZ and the states in M2 with uh, numbers like uh, 2345. Now imagine we're scanning a string in M M1 and we're in state X and we see an A. Well, we go to state Y. Now, if we're in machine 2, uh, scanning that same string, we see an A. Well, it depends on what state we're in. We could be in 3 or maybe we're in 4. If we're in 3 and we see an A, we go to 5. But if we were in 4 and we see an A, we go to 6. Okay. So now in our combined machine, we're going to have to come up with states to represent both of those combinations. So in fact, all possible combinations. So every state in in the combined machine is going to be uh, made from one state of from machine one and one state from machine two. So in my case, or in this case, they have names like X3 or Z6 or Y7 or Y6. So X3, this state right here, represents the idea that you're in this state in machine one and you're in three in machine two. And this state X4 corresponds to being in state X in machine 1, but in state 4 in machine 2. So if you get an A, you move to a Y. And if you're in 3, you move to a 5. So if we're in X3, we get an A, we move to Y5. But on the other hand, if we're in X and 4, and we get an A, we move to Y6. So that's why we have an edge from X4 on A to Y6. And the B edges are shown too. If we're in X and we get a B, we go to Z in machine 1. And in machine 2, it depends on whether we're in 3 or 4. We could either go to state 6 or 7. So we go to state Z6 or Z7. So now we're ready to show how to uh, build this machine. First of all, the set of states in our new combined machine will be constructed of pairs. It's a, a set of pairs. So each state you can think of as being labeled with two things. 
One is the name of a state from the first machine, R1, and the other element of the pair is the name of a state from machine 2. So formally we say our set of states is a set of pairs where the first thing is drawn from Q1 and the second thing is drawn from Q2. That's exactly what I've done here. So you can imagine all possible combinations of states from machine M1 and states from machine M2. I didn't show a state X6 or a state X7, but those states are implied to exist by this equation here. So now, given that our states in the new machine are pairs, I've drawn a little circle around them to make them look like states. So if we're in some state in the new machine, what does our new transition function tell us to do if we get some symbol such as an A? Well, it tells us to go to the state, okay, it's parenthesis, it's comma, two things, and a, and a closing parenthesis. This is a pair, so this is a legal um, element of set Q. So this is a new state. And what is that new state? Well, we just imagine that we are um, in state R1 in the first machine and we get an A. Where do we go? And then what about if we were in the second machine and we get an A from state R2? Where do we go? We'll take those two together and ask, you, and ask which state is that in our new machine? And that's how we build the transition function for the new machine. Our starting state for the new machine will be any, the state that is made from combining the initial states of the two machines. And what about our final states? Any state that contains an element from the final uh, states of machine 1 or the, the set of final states from machine 2 is going to be a final state in our combined machine. So this corresponds to the idea if there's any way to go through our new machine and end up in a state that would have been an accepting state in the old machine. For example, if Y is an accepting state, but 6 is not, then, but if, then if we end up in Y6, well, we should accept that string because that was an element of language 1, because Y was an accepting state. It was not an element of language 2 because 6 was not an accepting state. But imagine that 7 is an accepting state. If we end up in Z7, then that would have to be marked as an accepting state, regardless of whether Z was an accepting state, because 7 is an accepting state. So any state in the combined machine that has uh, either the first or the second uh, part being from the final state, so the two machines, would be an accepting state. So if either machine 1 or machine 2 would be in an accept state, we need to accept. And so that's how we construct the machine that represents uh, a combination of the two machines. Machine M will accept the union of the languages recognized by M1 and recognized by M2. Our next theorem is that the class of regular languages is closed under concatenation. What does that mean? Well, it means that if languages L1 and L2 are regular, then the language you get by concatenating those two languages is also regular. And what about the proof of this? Well, unfortunately we can't do it yet. Okay, we need non-determinism for that. And so that motivates our study of non-determinism, and that's what we'll look at in the next video.